Today's guest is Greg Dickerson. Greg is a serial entrepreneur, real estate developer, coach, and mentor. He has bought, developed, and sold over $250 million in real estate, built and renovated hundreds of custom homes and commercial buildings, developed residential and mixed-use subdivisions, and started 12 different companies from the ground up. Greg currently mentors some of the top entrepreneurs, real estate investors, and real estate developers in the country, helping them grow and scale their business, raise more capital, and do bigger deals. Greg's current clients have over $2 billion in asset under management and deals in the process. Today we will be talking about how Greg developed himself to go from a handyman to the multi-million real estate business, the advice he has for investors with what's going on in our nation, and how he builds his teams. Welcome to today's show. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today we have a very special guest, Greg. Thank you for joining us. Hey, it looks good to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I see you're really active. You're very involved with social media and also on the grounds when it comes to real estate. Before we get to today's topic and talking about real estate, I ask all of my guests to share about their background and how they got started in real estate. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a serial entrepreneur, real estate developer. I've been at it since 1997 as an entrepreneur. And before that, I graduated high school in 1985, joined the Navy, did four years right out of high school, did not go to college. I did retail in the Navy. And then after that, I worked in restaurants and construction. It's the only two things I've ever done in my life. In 1997, I moved to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, started a little construction company, remodeling handyman company, and took it from zero sales to 30 million in seven years. I started 12 other companies along the way. I learned how to invest in real estate and develop real estate along the way while I was doing that. So I basically, you know, all these companies to generate cash flow to invest in other assets, the classic rich dad formula. I read that book and I said, I want to be rich dad. And so that's what I did. I went and started a bunch of businesses and used the cash flow to invest in uh, other assets and grew and scaled from there. And here we are now, 23 years later and in a pretty good spot. And now I'm after impact and giving back and teaching and helping others and coaching people all over the world. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. How did you make that jump to start those businesses? What was that process like? So I started with one and I'm a natural born entrepreneur. So as a little kid, I was cutting grass, raking yards, and I'm talking elementary school. My dad taught me, he was not an entrepreneur. He was a career military. And so my mom was career with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, but he always taught me, if you want something, you need to go make the money and earn the money to have it. So I'd go out and I'd cut grass or rake yards or wash cars, whatever I needed to do. I'd knock on your door. Hey, Lewis, I'm Greg. I live down the street. I need to make some money. I'm going to do, I was in martial arts. I've got a testing coming up for my next belt in martial arts and it costs 40 bucks and I've got to pay for it. Man, what do you need done? I'll wash your car. I'll clean your house. I'll do whatever you want. And that's what I did as a kid. It's making a hundred bucks a week back in, oh, that was the early seventies when I was in elementary school. <laughs> that's how it all started. So anyways, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, even in the military. I did that because I wanted to serve my country. Every male in my family, we're all military. And uh, so I did that. When I got out, I was kind of working different jobs. A couple of them were for some entrepreneurs in the construction industry. And then I was working in restaurants and I got some really good management training in restaurants. And I moved to the Outer Banks of North Carolina in 1997 to start a restaurant, but I got into construction instead. So literally it started with leaving the W2 corporate world and deciding I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own business. And I just went out and started doing what I knew how to do, which was small, odd handyman jobs. I'm very handy. I could do little things. And I started with that, just doing little jobs, just me, myself, my truck and tools. I did 250,000 my first year in business in sales. My second year, 750, 1.2, 2.7, 12 million, and just on from there and started out doing little bitty handyman stuff. Then I hired somebody to come work with me in the field. Then I hired another person. Then I stepped out of the field, got an office manager learned how to do bigger projects. And I started building houses. I didn't know how to build a house. So I hired people that did, and I brought them in and let them help build this company for me and grew and scaled from there. And business is business, right? So I had restaurant background and training. Now I had this construction company. And as I was going along, people saw how quickly and successful I was very fast, which what I really was a leader, delegator, motivator. I mean, that's really what I am. I'm a delegator. I find great people and I coach them to success. I bring the right people in to fill my weaknesses, to do the things that I didn't know how to do. And then I coach them to success. But the most important thing was I let them do their job. So I'd never built a house and I wanted to create this company that built multi-million dollar houses. So I went and hired some of the best people from the top company in the area that was doing what I wanted to do. 
So I brought them in and I learned from them and I coached them and I led them and I inspired them with that vision. It's a lot like Tom Brady, right? So what did Tampa Bay do? They said, we want to go to the Super Bowl. So what do you do? You go get the best quarterback you could find to take your team to the Super Bowl. Do you think they told Tom Brady how to throw that football or what to do? Hmm. Uh-uh. They said, Tom, you've been to five of these things or however many. We want to go. Take us there. And they let him do his job. So that's what you do when you're building a team. You find people that are better than you, that are smarter than you, that have been there, done that. You bring them in and then you let them take you there. So that's what I did in every company that I had. That's how I did it. Yeah. That's powerful. And it saves you from having to spend time training someone. Now you can take yourself out of the picture and think bigger and what's next for the business and letting the A exactly. players yeah. do what they're good at. Yeah. Aces and places. You find champions, you put them in the right seat and you let them roll. Like I said, you don't bring Tom Brady into Tampa Bay and then say, okay, now you're a wide receiver. <laughs> you know, you find yeah. the guy that throws touchdowns and you bring him in, you put him at quarterback and you say, throw touchdowns. It sounds like you have a lot of systems also or processes in place to make be able to have all of this function mm -hmm. are there any like books or mentors that have helped you or you have just been learning on the go and improving things yeah so like i said i didn't go to college but i am very self-educated so I, i've never been one back in the day it was books on tape you had the little cassette walkman probably before your time so I was listening to books on tape all the time. I was reading on management, on business, on systems, a lot of great books. But anytime I wasn't reading, if I was out exercising, walking, whatever, I was pumping my mind full of the right kind of content and in my car driving. It wasn't music playing. It was professional and self-development stuff, real estate, business, personal, professional development. And then it was cassettes or we went from cassettes to CDs and from CDs to the first iPod, you know, back in the day, the 80 gig iPod, I've still got it somewhere just full of audiobooks, no music, not one, even my iPhone today, I don't have one song on it. It's all audiobooks. Hmm. That's uh, good. So I'm I love constantly audiobooks. pouring into myself, constantly developing myself and constantly learning and anything and everything from management philosophy books to business books, to biographies of great leaders. There's a ton of stuff out there. So I learned a ton through there, all the way back from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all of his books, you know, Robert Kiyosaki. I read Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon, about the power of a mastermind. And mastermind can be real in person. And it can also be, you know, people that you admire that you don't even know. And you learn from in, in whatever it is you want to do. It could be business, could be fitness, could be spiritual, could be anything. You want to learn something, find the best people in that industry and learn from them. Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time, read, read all his stuff. So that's kind of how it works for me. And then I was very fortunate in the area I was in, I was doing a lot of projects for a lot of very successful individuals in real estate and in business that were coming down to my area and buying these big multi-million dollar beach houses. So I was building houses for them and I was developing property with them and for them and doing projects. So I kind of learned, you know, from them and through them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you hearing my printer go off? I did a little. It's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. No problem. And as far as putting a team together and making sure that all those things go in place, how did you develop the confidence to go to one of those eight players and bring them on your team and get them to buy into this big vision, this goal that you have? That's the key. So it was a vision and I'm a leader, you know, I'm a leader, delegator, motivator. I mean, I'm, I'm a natural born leader. The question is, can leadership be taught? Can entrepreneurship be taught? And I mean, yeah, the philosophies of it, but at the end of the day, I'm just a natural born leader. I was always the guy that was picked as captain of the team. I was in charge of my division in the Navy. So it's just something that I was innately born with, which my dad was as well. So I kind of, I guess, got that from him. So the key is you have to have a vision. You have to believe in that vision, and then you have to be able to clearly articulate that vision to people and to the organization and get them to buy into it. And the key is you have to believe in it. You have to be passionate about it. And it, you know, it has to be a good idea. And even if it's not a good idea, you can still create that vision and communicate it in a way so passionately that you can get people to buy in and believe in it. But at the end of the day, people want to be part of something. They want to be part of a movement. It's not about the money. It's not about what you can pay them. It was an opportunity for a lot of these individuals I work with in these different companies to build something themselves, they weren't given that opportunity anywhere else. And that's what inspires and motivates people now is to be able to be part of something, to be part of an organization, a movement, and to grow something and actually contribute and be 
part of an organization where their thoughts, their input, their efforts matter and make a difference and they're not held back. In so many organizations, people are held back and they're not allowed to contribute. So that kind of is what makes the difference. And it wasn't for everybody. I mean, as I was growing, I mean, some people that I offered positions to turned me down because we were a young company and the perception was it was a risk versus staying with an established company that had been there forever. But as we know now, now this was 20 years ago, as we know now, there is no job security. The job security is in you. And now the startups are where everybody wants to be. So it's really interesting. So it gets easier as you go along. Yeah, that's good. What are some ways that you feel like you're growing passive income wealth today? So my philosophy on that is very different than everybody else. So passive income for a lot of people is investing in something that kind of just pays you on autopilot. For me, my passive income has been compounding cash. So I've always been a velocity of cash flow, compounding cash, growing cash. So I don't have to worry about anything else. So that's kind of been my avenue. And the passivity of that now is doing deals where I'm not actively involved day to day. So I'm still looking at deals and I'm still the one that leads them and gets them going, like from a development standpoint. So I've been a merchant developer pretty much my whole career, meaning I'll build something and sell it. Or it's a value add. It could be an existing structure and I'd renovate it, reposition it, whatever. But what my goal is from a passive standpoint is to redeploy the capital and let the capital grow in those investments for me through those vehicles. So it's not the traditional sense where I'm just investing a little bit here, investing a little bit there, and then the residual earnings from that. I'm, I'm a little bit more active in it. I've never been a true passive investor. Okay. But to me, it's passive because I've got projects going on everywhere and I don't have to be anywhere. You don't have to be directly involved with them. They can run on their own. Right. At this point, I'm leading, delegating, motivating, and I'm involved in companies all over the world and projects all over in my area. And there's teams that, that are on those projects that are doing the day-to-day. -day. So I'm just the brain trust. I'm just the leader and I'm over the operations and putting the teams together, bringing the financing together, that kind of stuff. Where do you see like things are perhaps going or what are some implications out there with how our nation is right now as far as investors? So the big issues on the table are going to be tax consequences going into 2021. So what is tax policy going to look like? What is monetary policy going to look like? So what I tell investors now is you really have to watch not only what the Fed says, but what are they doing? What are they loading their balance sheet with? Watch Treasury and what are the moves that they're making? Treasuries are up right now. So that's going to affect interest rates. So you have to watch that interest rate environment and then watch institutional investors and where they're putting their money. Again, not what they say, not what they come on CNBC and say, but where are they actually deploying the capital? So those are the types of things that you want to benchmark and you want to watch out for moving forward. But the big one is we just don't know what tax policy is going to look like. We don't know what regulation is going to look like and things like that, especially in the online world. So that's where the biggest changes are, obviously, especially of late, are happening that can really affect things. So if you're talking about real estate, it's a little bit more fundamental than just watching mm -hmm. the tax environment and monetary policy. Mm -hmm. That's good. Would you mind talking a little bit about what you focus on when you coach other people? Yeah. So it just depends. Some people are in, I'm coaching people doing different things. Some are scaling multifamily outfits. I've got one group that I've, I'm taking from, I don't know, maybe they were at 50 million and they're on track to do a billion this year in terms of assets under management and they're growing their organization. I've had other people that have gone from 500 million to a billion and then I've got people that are just getting started. So it really depends on where people are and what they're doing. And I mean, anything from multifamily syndication to real estate developers, I've got a couple software companies, I've got a dental practice that I'm working with. I've got some doctors I'm working with doing different things. So it all really depends on where people are, but the fundamental thing is usually putting systems in place, putting administration in place, growing and scaling capital raising efforts, growing and scaling marketing presence, things like that. And generally tightening up the organization and stuff like that. So I've got one guy I was coaching that never done a real estate deal. And I taught him how to do uh, subject to deals and he's done his first two deals. He'll make a hundred grand in six months of working with me on two deals with no money out of his pocket doing sub two. So it's really interesting. A lot of fun. Yeah. And you can be very creative with it also. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like about it. For me, I'm after impact mm -hmm. at this point in my life. And then the creativity of the different things that I'm seeing and doing through other people, it's really a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What would you say are three tips that have helped you hit real estate home runs in your life? 
So developing myself first and foremost, building my knowledge, my skill sets, my abilities, my understanding of finance, creative finance, those things. So that's number one. Number two, knowing the market. You've got to know the market. There's just no way around that. If you pay too much, you've got no way out of that. So understanding the market and then having multiple exit strategies when it comes to real estate specifically and business and companies, you've got to have options. You've got to have multiple exit strategies. And there's really a fourth one I'm going to add to that. And that is the most important metric before you make any investment is understanding risk and being able to, when I say understanding risk, what I mean by that is being able to accurately calculate the cost of that risk associated with that deal or that investment, and then understanding it to the point to where you can withstand it if that were to occur. So being able to accurately calculate it and understand it and withstand the impact of it if it does come to fruition. That's good. If you were in my shoes, is there a question that I maybe should have asked that I didn't or missed? So I guess the biggest thing is, do you have any limits? So if I were you, I would be asking, can I do a $100 million deal? Can I do a $200 million deal? Do I have any limits in what I can do in business and investing and in my life and career? And I would say, no, you can go as big as you want to go. And what I didn't know and didn't have was what we have now, this type of format. There's tons of podcasts out there with people that have been there, done that. You can get your brand and your presence out there now in a way that you couldn't do before free. Back in the day, I had to pay. I read Guerrilla Marketing was one of the first books I ever read, the original version. And that was all about signs and newspaper ads and billboards and the old school ways of promoting yourself. It was expensive. I had to spend $100,000 a year to promote a small company just to get it out there in a way that I can do for free now with social media. So Mm -hmm. that's what I would be asking if I were you with your guests is how can you be unlimited in everything that you do and don't limit yourself? Thank you. And there's also to add on to what you said, the power effect of something going viral online. If you're putting good content out there, people are going to be sharing, they're going to be liking it, interacting with it. And that is exposing you to a new audience as well. Yeah, it's service. So if you always come from the stand, so my philosophy in business has always been to serve others and to create opportunity for others and to provide opportunity for others. So if you think about that first and foremost, everything else will take care of itself. So the bigger you think, the bigger opportunity you provide, the bigger problem you solve, the more willing you are to serve, the bigger the things will be that you can do. How can people stay in contact with you if they want to find out what Greg Dickerson is up to? So that's it right there, gregdickerson.com. Everything's on there, my website, YouTube, Facebook, all my social media. So yeah, check it out. It's all there and I put out content every day. Awesome. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me.